an easy one. I really want this interview to, you know, to be on a kind of personal level. We're really interested about, you know, to know about your work. You know? So let's start to introduce yourself, who you are, and what's your role. So my name is Alfie Azavaya. I work in the European Parliament. I work for the Euro European Parliament Anti-Racism and Diversity Intergroup, um, which is called ARDI. And ARDI basically works in the European Parliament to promote non-discrimination and diversity. And I represent a grouping of MEPs, members of European Parliament, from different political groups, so from the, uh, from the far left to the moderate center right. And we have a bureau of eight members of European Parliament, one from each pan-European political group. And I coordinate the activities of the members of the intergroup on issues around non-discrimination, equality and diversity. So in the work of the European Parliament, we amend legislation, uh, own initiative reports, we write parliamentary questions, uh, oral questions and then press releases and letters and statements, but we also undertake a lot of advocacy in the European Parliament. Yeah, so, do you want to explain briefly what's the main party's goal and objectives and how the World Party is developing? So, across Europe, we're seeing a rise of extreme, uh, radical, insurgent far right parties, and the fundamental principles of non discrimination, equality, diversity are being challenged on a con consistent basis. And so the work of Adi is to challenge those who oppose these fundamental rights and protect the most vulnerable minorities and communities in Europe. So we look at issues around anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, Afrophobia, anti-Gypsism, but also intersectionality between LGBTI, gender, disability with race and ethnicity. And it's our duty, um, or the duty of my members of parliament, to really push and promote non-discrimination and equality. And so far, we've been very successful in this. You know, we've, um, we have about 70 members of European parliament who are affiliated to our intergroup. And over the course of the last year and a half, we've amended legislation from a wide range of issues, from counter-terrorism to migration to hate speech. But also, we've been doing a lot of work on, you know, promoting you know, the rights of NGOs, um, promoting the role of NGOs in, the work of, in our work, but also you know, in the wider work with the other institutions. So you have somehow anticipated some of the you know, key issues we'd like to cover in this interview. So would you like to start to say a little bit more about how the RD intergroup influenced the legislation process at EU level and in particular in regard to the anti-discrimination legislation? So, uh, Adi has been very effective so far in pushing uh, forward amendments or uh, um, reports on non-discrimination and anti-discrimination. Uh, anti -discrimination. So far, on issues around, like for example, counter-terrorism, we've tabled amendments where vulnerable communities, and in particular it's the Muslim uh, community, but people who are also perceived as Muslims, are not unfairly discriminated by counter-terrorism policies. So whilst we understand there's a need for security and protection of EU citizens, we also understand that needs to be balanced with the rights, the fundamental rights that every individual citizen of the EU has. On the issue of migration, I can give you a concrete example where the European Commission put forward a legislative proposal on safe countries. So if you, uh, these were seven, eight uh, countries in the Western Balkans and Turkey, which were going to be designated as safe countries. So if you came from one of those countries to the EU, as an asylum seeker or as a refugee, your application would be fast-tracked and you wouldn't necessarily have all of the same procedural rights and protections as you would if you came from another country. What Adi managed to do was have an amendment put into that legislation that made minorities exempt from that legislation. So in effect, if you are a minority within those countries, the safe countries legislation wouldn't apply to you and you would be protected and you'd be given you know, a full uh, hearing of uh, assessment on your on asylum and on your asylum process and not a fast track application. That's perfect. So that's a kind of request for the best you know practice example that you can give us success story yeah. about our team. Uh, is there any other let's say example that you can provide where our was particularly successful in achieving 
So on the issue of hate speech, um, Adi has been very successful in calling for uh, stricter sanctions against members of European Parliament who engage in hate speech. We understand that members of European Parliament, all political leaders, have a duty and responsibility to act respons responsibly when it comes to talking about minorities. We don't disagree with the principle of freedom of expression. Everyone has a right to freedom of expression, but that freedom of expression must come within the law. The EU is clearly set out in its framework decision of 2008 on racism and xenophobia, the restrictions on freedom of expression when it comes to hate speech. So incitement to hatred is an illegal act. And we believe that members of European Parliament should be held to the same standards as citizens of Europe. And therefore, where I can say we've had two successes is first of all in the European Parliament's own internal rules of procedure. These are the rules that govern the, uh, the work of members of European Parliament and their behaviour. And just recently um, we've tabled amendments to the EP's rules of procedure to make the sanctions even more stronger to, against those MEPs who engage in hate speech. So for example, the, the fine of a salary, a salary suspension has been tripled. And if an MEP engages in hate speech uh, on, a, on a consecutive basis, the, the fine is doubled. So in effect, it's going to act as a deterrent for MEPs to engage in hate speech. Also, MEPs who engage in hate speech will now not be able to represent the European Parliament in any external activities of the European Parliament for one year. So these are concrete examples of how we're trying to set the example from within the European Parliament. Just, last, just two weeks ago, uh, we also saw that the parliamentary immunity of two members of European Parliament who engaged in hate speech, one against my own boss, the former Italian Minister of Integration, Cecilio Chienge, when one of the MEPs from the Italian far-right party, the Lega Nord, uh, called her an orangutan and you know, referenced her to being a monkey. Well, when he tried to have his parliamentary immunity upheld, the European Parliament decided that his actions didn't constitute the activities of the work of a member of European Parliament. And therefore his parliamentary immunity was waived. And now he's going to face the trial at the court of Milan. And so I think that's also showing that, you know, we are making good efforts. And on this particular issue, I have to stress that members of European Parliament, all political leaders have a, a duty because Hate speech leads to hate crime. There's a, there's a clear co correlation there in society. And the important thing here is that members of European Parliament have to understand how powerful their words are when they're reaching out to European citizens. And if they don't act with responsibility and with care, we will see a rise in, in hate incidents against vulnerable minorities who are already feeling threatened. We've seen what's happened with Brexit. We've seen what's happening across Europe with the Austrian presidential election and with the rise of the Front National in, in France, with Gert Wilders in, in Denmark. Already we see that in, in Finland we see the true Finns, a far-right political party, are actually in government. So we have to be careful in the direction we want to go in Europe. Are these plays an important role in making civil society closer to the European institutions? Would you like to give us an overview about what are the means for civil society and civil society organizations to get engaged with RD and how do you mediate between civil society and the EU institutions? Well, we have a clear man or I have a clear mandate from my bosses that when I started, the idea was to make the European Parliament more hospitable and also more open for NGOs, but for youth, for citizens to come and express their views and to come and meet. With, uh, with the MEPs, but also with other actors from committees, from uh, different political groups. And so since I've been in my position, I focused a lot on working with different NGOs and different groups who represent vulnerable minorities, but also from the majority population. And on a, con on a, on a weekly basis, I meet with five or six NGOs. These NGOs, not only do I meet with them, but they also co-host events with us. They provide inputs for Im amendments that we will table. And also, you know, they provide speaking points and uh, suggestions of speaking points for members of parliament when there's an oral debate on a particular issue around anti-discrimination. It's also that something we've been doing is trying to uh, make the other European institutions, the European Commission, the European External Action Service, which is the EU's foreign, foreign service, 
also come in line with our approach. So one way we do that is by uh, arranging meetings between the Commission, the European External Action Service and the NGOs. And it's also that when we organize um, events and hearings within the European Parliament, we make sure to always have one or two NGOs present to speak. And then there's of course other NGOs who can take the floor in the question and, and answer part. But at these events, we have the Commission there, we have members of European Parliament there, and so NGOs can directly interlock with their, with their counterparts in the institutions. Now I believe, and my, I know my boss's family believe, that this reach, this reach out has to be extended and we have to go beyond the Brussels bubble, beyond the NGOs that are based in Brussels, but also in member states because there's a clear conflict between what's happening at Brussels level and at member states level. And if we want better implementation because the EU is often misunderstood. The, the role of the EU is to be a watchdog, but also to put forward legislation and policies. And implementation of the legislation and policies come at member state level. So when people take shots or when people fire aims at the EU in a negative way, it's often that the EU has legislated, but member states are not uh, implementing that legislation or policies. We see this with the Roma strategies. We see this with you know, the framework decision on racism, racism and xenophobia. We see this also with the Victims' Crime Directive, that implementation by member states is not being done. And that's why it's vital that we get NGOs from the member states to come here, meet with us, so that they know which legislation and policies are available to them to, to push and lobby their government to you know, implement, but also to you know, up, uphold. Um, if I was an NGO, let's say a, a small local NGO in a uh, EU member state, like Slovakia, what do I need to do to be in contact with you? How do I approach? Okay, so there's a variety of ways that you know I can be contacted okay. and first of all we have our website um, which I think will be made available uh, in, in the video but uh, also we have uh, social media but then it is true that um, we have a mailing list but that mailing list is normally from uh, people who I meet and you know taking their cards and their business cards so what we would ask is you know for Brussels NGOs to reach out to their counterparts in member states to put them directly in contact with us and that's one way they can reach out to us also on our website we have a specific area of the website which is a reporting uh, form so if you know that of an incident in your member state or in your country where there's been racism discrimination or other forms of intolerance you can register it online on our form and that form will directly come to me and then I sit down with my bureau and discuss how we act upon that. Sometimes the case is that it's an issue that is not covered at EU level and it's a member state competence so we can't deal with it. But if it is a, a competence of the EU, then we will take some action in our parliamentary work or non-parliamentary work to promote uh, or to raise awareness of that particular issue. So I think on a monthly basis uh, we interact with other European institutions and also with other foreign ministries and other governments. So regularly I'm in contact with the US State Department, the British Foreign and Commonwealth Office and other member states uh, uh, representations here in Brussels but also at uh, member state level. In terms of the other European, European Union institutions, I regularly meet with my counterparts from DG Justice, which is the, the Director General responsible for non-discrimination and equality. As I meet with you know, the DG Employment, because a lot of the issues around non-discrimination go into employment, and you know, with home affairs and stuff like this. So we regularly have dialogue with our counterparts in other institutions. With the European External Action Service, we do a lot of work on anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, knowing that our partners on these issues are from outside of the EU. So with anti-Semitism, a regular partner of ours would be the, the Israeli government, and on um, Islamophobia, it would be those countries that you know come from the Organization of Islamic uh, Countries. And we regularly work with the EAS to see how we can bring these partners on board to make sure that we hear the right concerns and the right concerns of of these groups are promoted. So for example, in anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, 
often we are, we're seeing a disconnect between what Jewish and Muslim people are feeling in Europe to what um, Jewish or Muslim uh, countries with majority Jewish or uh, majority Muslim populations are saying. And often that is not reflect, often those governments don't reflect the problems that Jewish or Muslim uh, people are facing in Europe. So by working with the EAS and working with these countries directly, we can change the narrative to really, um, uh, really fight for the concerns that are affecting Jewish and Muslim people here in Europe. On, for example, with DG Justice, um, the European Commission has launched this high-level group on racism, xenophobia and other forms of intolerance. This is a, a high-level group that meets twice a year. It involves two representatives of member states, normally from the Ministry of Justice and the Ministry of Home Affairs, um, European Commission officials and NGOs. And we are one of the, the consulting partners of the European Commission on this particular high-level group. My own uh, boss, Soraya Post, who's the co one of the co-presidents of the intergroup, she spoke, uh, gave a keynote speech with Commissioner Jourova at the launch of the high-level group in June. And in December, we will have a second high-level group meeting, and we will be talking about various issues around racism, xenophobia, and other forms of intolerance. And there, we're working directly with the NGOs, with the European Commission, and other and member states to ensure that you know we have a joint up approach to fighting discrimination.